hope to witness to several of her cousins. Oh, amen. Okay. My brother-in-law again. All right. I will. I will. By all means, try to remember that. By all means. Good. I think. You want to go here? Okay, we got it. All right, I sound big again. Hey, welcome. Good morning. It's good to see you all in Sunday school. I hope you came ready to worship the Lord. And so let's do this. Uh, I, I think we ought to sing a little bit about Jesus Christ coming back. So why don't you grab a hymnal, stand and turn with me to number 589. 589, Jesus is coming again. Amen. It'll cure whatever ails you this morning. On the first, here we go. Marvelous message we bring, glorious carol we sing, wonderful word of the King, Jesus is coming again, coming again, coming again. Maybe morning, maybe noon, maybe evening, and maybe soon. Coming again, coming again. Oh, what a wonderful day it will be. Jesus is coming again. 589 on the second. Forest and flower exclaim, mountain and meadow the same, all earth and heaven proclaim, Jesus is coming again. Smile now. Coming again, coming again, maybe morning, maybe Maybe evening and maybe soon Coming again Coming again Oh, what a wonderful day it will be Jesus is coming again Standing before him at last Trial and trouble all past Crowns at his feet we will cast Jesus is coming again Coming again Coming again Maybe morning, maybe noon Maybe evening and maybe soon Coming again Coming again Oh, what a wonderful day it will be Jesus is coming again Amen The Bible says, um you know, uh, we're supposed to cheer ourselves with this thought. Amen. Christ returneth. 584. 584. If you know this real well, sing it out. If you don't, sing it out. On the first. Here we go. <laughs> it may be at morn when the day is all waking. When sunlight in darkness and shadow is breaking, that Jesus will come in the fullness of glory to receive from the world his own. O Lord Jesus, how long, how long, and we shout that glad song, Christ returneth, hallelujah, hallelujah, amen, hallelujah, amen. So 
How many of you know this song? All right, you guys are the ones that are singing really loud on the second verse. Okay, here we go, second. It may be at midday, it may be at twilight. It may be perchance at the blackness of midnight will burst into light in the face of his glory when Jesus receives his own. O oh Lord Jesus, how long, how long, ere we shout that glad song, Christ returneth, hallelujah, hallelujah, amen, hallelujah, amen. This is the best one. O oh joy, O oh delight, should we go without dying? No sickness, no sadness, no sad and dying. Caught up through the clouds with the Lord into glory, Jesus receives his own. O oh Lord Jesus, how long, how long? And we shout that glad song, Christ returneth, hallelujah, hallelujah, amen, hallelujah, amen. All right, you did well. Let's do one more. One day, 595. You notice the theme here? He's coming back. Yeah. All right, you're all warmed up now. Let's hear it. On the first. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt amongst men, my example is he living he loved me dying he saved me buried he carried my sins far away rising he justified freely forever one day he's coming Oh, glorious day. One day they led him on Calvary's mountain. One day they rolled him to die on the tree. Suffering anguish, despised and rejected. Bearing our sins, my Redeemer is He. Living He loved me, dying He saved me. Buried He carried my sins far away. Rising He justified freely forever. One day He's coming, O oh, glorious day. One day the grave, one day the stone rolled away from the door. Then He arose over death He had conquered. Now is ascended, my Lord, evermore. Living he loved me, dying he saved me. Buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day. 
One day the trumpet will sound for his coming. One day the skies with his glories will shine. Wonderful day my beloved was bringing. Glorious Savior, this Jesus is mine. Living he loved me. Dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day. All right, you may be seated. You may be seated. Well, for want of anyone else jumping up here and introducing Brother Wolski, I guess I'll do that this morning. It's been really good, all this Sunday school that we've had from various minds. It's, it's amazing the different tools God makes to accomplish His, his means, and uh, it's amazing He uses us. Amen. So, Brother Wolski, would you come up and give us the Word of God? Thank you. Thank you. I was waiting... I was waiting for my four friends to help this paralytic up here, but they didn't show up, so I decided to join down, down here myself, or up here. Uh, I apologize for this circumstance as it is, and the chair, if it wasn't for the chair, I wouldn't be here, and preacher asked me before I'd lined up coming, or you know, speaking, oh, way back two months ago, or whatever it was, and when we got close to it, I said, or he asked me again, and I said, can you do it and whatever? I said, sure, I'd be happy to do it as long as I have a chair. And as long as you don't mind there being a chair up front here. So he said, Brother Espinosa preached the last three times or so uh, from a chair, so he didn't mind. So if he didn't mind, you don't have the opportunity to mind. <laughs> so uh, anyway, my wife's off. Mike is Mike. Is it on now? Is it on now? Sounds like it. All right. All right, Mike, your mic is off. Okay. All right, so um, if you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2, please. 2 Timothy chapter 2. The uh, theme of my Sunday school class is what we're going to see here just as a kickoff verse. Seems like this is a little bit low. There, try that. So if you look at chapter 2, verse 15, 2 Timothy, the Bible says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so the course of study that I have for Sunday school uh, since I started back five years ago uh, here was uh, this theme, to rightly dividing the word of truth. So that's what we've attempted to do, looking at different Bible studies, determining what the Bible says in regard to different issues. And uh, so today I'm going to do a repeat from last year, my Sunday school class, uh, what I took four or five weeks to do. I'm going to try to condense. Okay, we're, we're on now. Maybe we could tone it down a little bit. Some people trying to sleep in here. Others trying to wake up with their coffee, right? <laughs> all right. Anyway, okay, we'll work things, all the kinks out here and there. So, uh, by the way, this, uh, this new year, we'll be teaching uh, the first time I've taught it as far as the book of the Bible. We're going to be teaching the book of Hebrews. And the reason for that is because uh, if you read the book of Hebrews uh, without, a, from, without a dispensational approach to your Bible, without rightly dividing the word of truth, you're not going to make heads or tails out of a lot of places. So that's what we're going to be looking at 
uh, the beginning this year. I don't know. I doubt that we'll finish it this year, but we'll see, you know, what happens. Uh, this morning, I'd like to look at one individual. And by the way, turn over to um, Acts chapter 9, please. And just with that reference, you should automatically know who it is that we're going to be talking about. But you're going to say, what, what does this have to do with rightly dividing the word of truth? This is the Apostle Paul. This is where he gets saved. Well, it does have a lot to do with rightly dividing the word of truth. And a, a question I would ask us today is this. You know, why did, why did God save the Apostle Paul? And, you know, simple answer, because he was lost. I understand. But why did he save him and then call him to the specific ministry that he, he gave to him? You know, why, why did, in other words, why did God, he, God had 11 apostles he could have used in this particular ministry. Starting with Peter and Andrew and James and John, and, you know, etc. But he chose Paul. Why didn't he choose one of the 11? Uh, why is it that we emphasize the Apostle Paul? As far as I'm concerned, and I think you would agree with me on this, that outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Apostle Paul is the most important and central figure in the New Testament. Period. You have 27 books in the New Testament. Almost half of them, 13, are written by the Apostle Paul. So we gain a lot from the Apostle Paul. We exalt, in a sense, uh, his ministry. Um, you're in Acts chapter 9, but I want you to turn to, if you will, before we get there, I want you to turn to two places, uh, Matthew chapter 5 and Ephesians chapter 4. The, the problem with the Apostle Paul is, uh, as far as some people are concerned, is simply this. Prior to Paul, you had Peter. And Peter, of course, if you were Roman Catholic or raised Roman Catholic, Peter would have been the central figure. Far more important than the Apostle Paul. Next in line to uh, Jesus Christ himself, of course, because Peter was the first pope. We all know that. Well, we all know that's what the Catholics teach. And therefore, Peter has an exalted position. At the same time, uh, for instance, we, when we were in Poland, I, uh, I met up with two different people at different times. One of the fellows, uh, one man came to our church. Uh, and then later, my wife and I went over to his house and, and followed up on him and all that. But he, uh, he was definitely Catholic. He was not, he was interested, but he wasn't going to get saved. But the one thing that, he, that stood out with him was simply this. He rejected Paul's writings. And what he exalted, of course, were the writings of Jesus Christ, or the sayings and sermons of Jesus Christ. Rightly so. I mean, Jesus Christ is none other than our, our Lord and Savior, right? He's our Redeemer. Uh, everything goes back to Jesus Christ. I'm not here at all, uh, in any way, shape, or form, here to minimize Jesus Christ, his sayings, his ministry, whatsoever. But when you talk to somebody about salvation today, how many verses do you quote to them regarding or coming from the Lord Jesus Christ as opposed to possibly the Apostle Paul, etc.? What I mean by that is this. Look with me in Matthew chapter 5. If, if you're a Roman Catholic, if you grew up as a Roman Catholic, again, I say that they want to exalt what Jesus Christ said over Paul, period. And there's a reason for that. Uh, the reason is simply this. Uh, Paul has a lot of things to say that are very controversial to a Catholic. And Jesus Christ, not so. And many things that Jesus Christ said are adored by all of us, of course, but they're adored by Catholics and liberal Protestants, etc., because they give the appearance of working your way to heaven. And that's, you know, really what it's all about as far as they're concerned. So if I'm in uh, Matthew chapter 5, talking about the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, we'll look at, we'll start in verse 16, obviously a verse that applies then and applies now. And let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. A great verse. Great application for all of us today. Just like it was back then when Jesus spoke it. But verse 17 
Uh, let's see. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm in five. I wanted to be in six. My mistake. It's the same corner of the page. I wanted to be in six. Um, in chapter six, he's going on. This is still the Sermon on the Mount, five, six, and seven. Look what he says in verse 14. But if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now, does that, is that a verse that you would use today as you're talking to people? Are you going to, this is the words of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, I agree. But there are words that were spoken before the cross. And there are words that are spoken in the Sermon on the Mount, which is in essence a constitution for the future kingdom. Are you depending upon forgiveness from God because you forgive people? Look over with me in Ephesians 4. I asked you to look at Ephesians 4. <coughs> Excuse me. Ephesians 4, and we're in the last verse. Verse 32. Admonitions to believers. Paul says this. He concludes chapter 4 and verse 32, stating, And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another. So God will forgive you. But that's not what it reads, is it? Forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. We forgive on the basis of the fact that we've been forgiven. Today, as a Christian, you don't go around trying to forgive people in order to elicit from God forgiveness for you. That's not how it works today. That's what Jesus said well, applied then, and it will apply in the, in the millennial kingdom. But for you and I today, now, let me back up just a second. By all means, it's good to forgive people. And to forgive somebody can elicit, we don't believe in karma, but we do believe in you reap what you sow. So if you have an unforgiving spirit, you can expect that people towards you are going to have an unforgiving spirit. If you have a forgiving spirit, you can hope, not necessarily expect, but you can hope that people will also have a forgiving spirit for you too. But as far as between us and God, our relationship goes is based on Ephesians 4.32. We forgive because God's placed his Holy Spirit in us in its desire on our heart to please him, that it would be a fruit of the Holy Spirit and that we would rebound and forgive God or forgive those people that do something against us. So my question is simply this. Jesus Christ is our Savior. Paul's not our Savior. But when it comes to a practical matter of forgiveness, who are you going to follow? Are you going to say, I'm throwing out Paul's writing because Jesus is my Savior. I'm going to follow him completely. Or I'm going to follow the, the uh, apostle Peter. Please go to Acts chapter 9, please. Acts chapter 9. So my point is simply this. There are those that are going to try to take the epistles of Paul out from underneath you unless you rivet yourself in his teachings. And we'll expound upon that throughout this uh, lesson today, hopefully. You're going to place your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior by all means. So, many of what, so much of what he said has direct spiritual application to us today by all means. But some of what he says does not have doctrinal application to us today. We just have to keep that in our minds and in our hearts when we read through the Bible. So we're simply trying to rightly divide the word of truth. So when we get to Acts chapter 9, when we see in verse, um, look at verse 6, obviously Paul's on his way to, uh, he's going to persecute uh, some Christians. He, he sees a light. He he's falls down off his horse. He's, uh, look at verse 6. Trembling and astonished, he said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? So he'd already recognized, who art, thou, who art thou, Lord? 
Jesus identifies himself. So now Paul responds to the one that he now knows is Jesus in this light shining from the heavens, speaking to him, and he recognizes he's the Lord God Almighty. He's not just this Jesus that's uh, uh, creating a sect and a heretical group of, Judy, of Jews. He's this Jesus who is the Lord and is the Christ. And I believe he gets saved right here because whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And what does he say knowing that he's speaking to Jesus? He says, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Now, what's he going to do? Look down at verse 15. This is what God has called Paul to do. He's Saul, but later, of course, we know that he changes his name to Paul. Verse 15. But the Lord said unto him, this is speaking to Ananias, Go thy way, for he, Saul, slash Paul, is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. So Jesus Christ is calling Paul out of the crowd. He responds to him. Saul responds properly and gets saved. And God says, okay, I've got something for you to do. You're going to go out to the Gentiles. Now, my question goes back to what I asked before. Why? Didn't he have 11 apostles that already had heard the word from him to go into the world? Go in the world, uh, teach all nations, baptizing them, etc. in Matthew 28. And in uh, Mark, 15, or Mark 16, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. And then here in the book of Acts, flip back to chapter 1 for a sec. So we'll be in chapter 2 in a minute. Chapter 1 and verse 8. We know that the Lord is speaking to the apostles that are there, but we know that we apply it to ourselves today as well. But he says in verse 8, but ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Now speaking again to these same apostles that he gave a great commission or a worldwide commission to in Matthew 28 and in Mark 16 and spoke of the same things in Luke 24. Now he reiterates it in Acts chapter 1. And ye shall be witnesses unto me. You know, you don't have to be called to be a missionary to do what Jesus says to these apostles here. Because he didn't call them all to necessarily be missionaries or pastors, etc., but he called them to be a witness. That applies to every one of us. We're all called to be a witness. So your witness is unto me both in Jerusalem, so not just in one locality, both in Jerusalem, that's the starting point, the hub, that's where they are, they're at. And in all Judea, concentric circles, so now you've gone further. And Samaria, you've gone further. And then lastly, the uttermost part of the earth. So again, the third or possibly fourth, if we include Luke chapter 24, the Lord has singled out these 11 apostles to go into the world. But then in Acts chapter 9, he saves Paul and calls him to be apostle to the Gentiles. How come he didn't call one of these other guys? Not to be, uh, uh, lack of respect at all, but he did only call the Apostle Paul. By the way, in Acts chapter 8, when Saul, the Apostle Paul, when Saul begins to threaten the church and people scatter, going around preaching Jesus Christ, guess where the apostles stay? In Jerusalem. Other people leave for their lives, but the apostles stay in Jerusalem. And even all the way up to Acts chapter 11, we won't look at the verse, but in Acts chapter 11, the verse says that they went about preaching only to the Jews. All the way as far as Acts chapter 11. Long after Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, and even Acts chapter 1. So why Paul? And I believe, in my opinion, I believe this all centers around their backgrounds and their experiences. 
What I mean is this. So you have 11 fellows out there, <clears throat> the 11 apostles. <clears throat> Their background is they spent three and a half years with the Lord. Three and a half years. We don't have them going on sabbaticals. We don't have them, you know, taking off on vacations necessarily. But it appears that three and a half years, they're basically day and night with the Lord Jesus Christ. Where he went, they went. They're going around through Galilee. They're up above Galilee. They're over a Perea on the other side of the Jordan River. They're in uh, Jerusalem, part of Judea. They're going back and forth all the time. So they're hearing, and they're no doubt inter talking with the Lord throughout their journeys. What are you going to do when you're walking? You're not on a train. You're not on a bus. You're not on a you know, in a car or whatever else. You don't have a phone. You don't have MP3 players. You know, you don't have things in your ears. You're, you're just listening. You're watching. You're talking. Three and a half years with the Lord. You're seeing all the miracles. Well, back up. Sermon on the Mount. As I said, when the first things they hear him preaching is he's preaching, repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. A literal, physical, material kingdom. The Bible says in, in Matthew, uh, Gospel of Matthew a couple of times that he preached the gospel of the kingdom. Kingdom being the kingdom of heaven in the context. And then when he gets to the Sermon on the Mount, as I mentioned already, he's preaching to them a, what basically the rules, regulations, constitution that will be involved and expected of them in the millennial kingdom. This is what they're immersed in. They're seeing his miracles authentic, that authenticize the fact that he was the Messiah. That he was, in fact, the only reason the miracles were accomplished, the only reason the Lord performed the miracles, you can start in John chapter 2 and read that, and all the way through the Gospel of John, you see it, was to prove to them that who he was. Because the Son of Righteousness would have come with healing in his wings. So as he went about, the Messiah was to have the ability to heal, perform miracles, and that's what Jesus did. I mean, my, if Jesus performed miracles simply to heal people, and I'm not being facetious, but he did a poor job because he left a lot of people lame, blind, halt, withered, leprous, etc. In fact, the only people he healed were those he came in contact with. But guess where he was? One place at one time. So don't get me wrong, but the Lord Jesus Christ is here and, and he touches me and I'm healed. Praise God. But there are people all around this city, county, state, country, world, far worse. Oh, by the way, operation surgery a week from Tuesday. Appreciate your prayers. I'll come out a new man. <laughs> Won't you be glad for that too? That's just my back, not my heart. But the heart's already, already is a new man in Christ. So these disciples saw all of these things that Jesus did. They heard all the things that he said. And this is something that he said also. You don't have to turn, but in Matthew 10, 5 and 6, Jesus said to his apostles, Go not into the way of the Gentiles. And into, the, into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Wow. My point is this. The Apostle Paul is also a Jew, that's obvious. But, Jesus, but Paul did not have three and a half years of his life invested in the ministry, the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. Paul didn't spend three and a half years of his life with an emphasis on a kingdom to come with an emphasis on a Jewish Messiah. He didn't have those past experiences, habits uh, that shaped his thinking. So we're in Acts chapter 1. So after the resurrection, 
Jesus did spend 40 days teaching the apostles. Look at Acts 1, verse 3. So, to whom also, and then the apostles are in the context of verse 2, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Wow. 40 day Bible study with Jesus Christ. 40 days. Now, it's one thing back three and a half years, but now they have seen their hopes crushed, their fears realized. He's taken, he's crucified. But three days later, gloriously, he's risen from, raised from the dead. And now they're exultant to the point that we're going to see Peter in chapter 2 preach on the street where they were cowering in the upper room with a locked door. Forty days preaching to them, speaking to them about the things of the kingdom of God. So what was he tell, telling them about? Well, no doubt he reiterated what he had said back in uh, like Luke chapter 24. Remember those two fellows on the road to uh, Emmaus? That when they met Jesus and finally when he revealed himself to them and how he expounded to them how that Christ must suffer and then be glorified. And so he took them through the Old Testament, showing them verses and references, speaking about the Messiah and what would have to happen to him. So no doubt during this time, he's given them an object lesson. All they have is the Old Testament anyway. And he's showing them how he fulfilled verse after verse after verse after verse throughout through his birth, through his life, through his death. Also, obviously, he's speaking to them about the new birth. He told John the, or Nicodemus about the new birth. But there's something he didn't speak to them about. It says the kingdom of God, but there's something he did not speak to them about. And he did not speak to them about the church. And we're going to see why in just a little bit. So look with me a second to verse um, 6. Same context, verse, well, we'll start in verse uh, 5. Actually, we have to start in verse 4. But being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. So stay here for a while. But wait for the promise of the Father, which is going to be the Holy Spirit. He spoke about that in the upper room in John chapter uh, 14, 15, and 16. But wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but speaking of a future event that's going to take place if they remain in Jerusalem, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Great. Now, he's going to be taken up from them and momentarily, right? The angel's going to say, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye here gazing up into heaven? Jesus that you see going up is going to come down the same like manner, etc. Prophesied in the book of Zechariah. So they have one last shot at him. One last question. Let's look at verse 6. What possibly would be on their minds? When they therefore were come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Their mind was saturated with the thought of the kingdom. When they met Jesus, he preached to them, as I said already, about the kingdom. They anticipated the kingdom. And just before he's going to leave, even after 40 days teaching them things of the kingdom of God, omitting, parenthesis, omitting the church, they ask him about the kingdom. Now, go to chapter 2. I put on the board, and I'll get up in a little bit and look at it, but I want to, I want to look at a couple of verses first. <clears throat> on the board, on the top of the board, the first timeline, you might have thought when you looked at that and Brother Rome was singing these great songs about the second coming, you might have thought, oh, well, this is going to be all about the second coming today. And they got together and they got, ver no, that, that's not it at all. And in reality, the lesson's not about the second coming as such or Bible prophecy as such. 
But when Peter begins to, this, the top line is Peter's world view. That's it. I'll explain it in a minute. So we're in Acts chapter 2. We're in verse 1, when the day of Pentecost fully come. Then, of course, you read on down. You've got the Holy Spirit coming down, descending upon them, etc. They're speaking in tongues. Everybody there that's come, all the people that have come from different areas around the Mediterranean Sea to come for this feast day, one of the three feast days they were attend, to attend, Passover, Pentecost, and Feast of Tabernacles. And they hear, and it's a miracle. And then Peter gets up and preaches to them. Verse 14, Then Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, etc., and what does he start out doing? In verse 16, he begins to quote from the prophet Joel. And look what he's speaking about, verse 16. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass in the last days. The last days. Saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, your sons and daughters shall prophesy, uh, young men see visions, your old men shall dream dreams, etc., etc., etc. Come on down to 19. And I will show wonders in the heaven above, signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire, vapor of smoke. Sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood. Does this sound like the church age to you? Is this what's happening in, before us today? Not yet. And he says at the end of verse 20, before that great and notable day of the Lord come. The day of the Lord, all through the Old Testament. The tribulation period as we know it today. So when Peter's preaching, he's preaching to them about what he sees as coming events on their calendar. Go to the end, go to um, the end of his message. Look down at verse 36. This is his conclusion, speaking to Jews and uh, Jews that are in, congregated in Jerusalem. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. You say, well, that's great. Yeah, but wait a minute. He's made Jesus, who they crucified, both Lord, deity, and Christ. Christ is Messiah. Christ is your New Testament, Greek, for Messiah in the Old Testament. It's the anointed one, such as in um, uh, Psalms chapter 2, or Psalm 2. So he's presenting Jesus to those Jews, not as a savior to believe on for forgiveness of your sins, but as a Messiah to receive, therefore God can begin to develop the events that will lead into the tribulation period, his return, and then the millennial kingdom. Look at chapter 13. I'm sorry, chapter 3. Chapter 3, next chapter. Continuing, this is Peter again speaking. And look what he says. After he gives the gospel out, he's, he's talking about Jesus Christ suffering, etc., and raising from the dead. He's speaking about that to this crowd that's congregated because of the healing of the one lame man. But verse 19, look what his emphasis is. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing, the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Times of refreshing is not the church age. We're talking about the millennial kingdom. Look what he says in 21. Whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things. Times of restitution of all things, again, is a reference to the millennial kingdom. So if you can see up here, I know this is kind of small, but obviously what we have is Calvary and the Lord dying. That was prophesied. This 69 weeks goes back to Daniel's 70-week prophecy. And at the end of 69 weeks, it says the Messiah will be cut off. He was. That leaves one week left. Peter's there at Pentecost and preaches. 
He's anticipating that next week is coming up. He's anticipating that what's happening in front of them is a prelude to God establishing or setting up or allowing the events for the tribulation to begin. The opening of the Antichrist, etc. One world government, the mark of the beast, everything else. And then all of the, all the book of Revelation, which he alludes to and references in the book of Joel, the verses that he quotes from chapter two of Joel. Then the day of the Lord, this is the day of the Lord he's talking about. The Lord comes back and then we have the times of refreshing, times of restitution of all things, the millennial kingdom. That was his worldview. You say, why did, why did God save the Apostle Paul? Because all of those Jews had that worldview on their mind. They, God wanted to, if we look at it the way we talk today, God wanted to, um, he wanted to work outside the box. He wanted to get outside their thinking. And he chose somebody. And that's the Apostle Paul. Um, in doing so, look with me at uh, ooh, Acts. We're in Acts. Acts 26. Acts 26. Now, this is something Paul goes. He's going over his conversion testimony. And in going over his conversion testimony to the King Agrippa, he says this about the Lord. You know, what we have because the Apostle Paul gets saved in chapter 9, because of what took place here, let me come back here. Pentecost, the Jews had an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ once again. They rejected him here, but God gives them a second chance. Many get saved, what, 3,000? But the nation itself didn't. But God gives them another chance, doesn't he? Acts chapter 7. And Stephen preaches. And the crowd responds dramatically, but not positively. Very dramatically, and they stone him to death, don't they? And God, at that point, God is beginning to close the door for Israel. And at the same, simultaneously, he's beginning to open the door for the Gentiles. Acts chapter 7, Stephen gets stoned to death. What happens in Acts chapter 8? Philip goes out and he goes to Samaria and starts preaching. The Holy Spirit calls him to the desert place and he wins a Ethiopian Jew. He, he was a proselyte to Judaism and he wins him to the Lord. In Acts chapter 9, the apostle Paul gets saved who becomes the apostle to the Gentiles. In Acts chapter 10, successive chapters, in Acts chapter 10, we see that Peter speaks to Cornelius. And Cornelius, the first true Gentile believer, gets saved. Then in Acts chapter 13, Paul goes on a missionary journey. And the Jews reject it. And he says, I'm going out to the Gentiles. In Acts chapter 8, he's in Asia Minor, uh, modern day Turkey. He ends up in Corinth, in Greece, and the same thing happens. He's preaching in a synagogue. The Jews reject. He said, I'm going to the Gentiles. He ends up in Acts chapter 28 in Rome, and he speaks to the, has the uh, Jews congregate to him, and they can't come to grips with it. They can't come to an agreement. And Paul says, okay, God's done with you, and he's going to the Gentiles, and they will receive it. So what happened? What happened is simply, God put a, a balloon. When Peter was preaching and Stephen preached and he rejected, or they rejected uh, Stephen's message, God began to say, okay, I'm about done with you guys. And he inserted right here, he inserted a balloon and it just went further and further and further and further and now we're about 2,000 years apart from where it started to where we are today and this is of course the church age
God didn't reveal that to Peter. Peter didn't preach about the church in Acts chapter 2. God didn't reveal that to any of the other apostles, but he revealed it to the apostle Paul. We're in, go to Galatians chapter 1, please. Let me show you what happened. What happened is simply this. God saved Paul, but after Paul got saved, God told him, don't you go down to Jerusalem. Now I'm reading between the lines. Don't go down to Jerusalem. Those guys are set in their ways. They have a certain worldview, and they're going to influence you along those lines if you go down there. So look what he says in uh, Galatians chapter 1, verse 11. Paul speaking about the gospel. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Look down with me at verse 17. Neither when I, uh, verse 16. To reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me. But I went into Arabia and returned again into Damascus. Evidently after Paul got saved. God and, and his impulse would have been. I need to get around those Christians down in Jerusalem. I need to attend some of their Bible Institute classes. And God said nope nothing doing. You're going over here by yourself, and I'm going to teach you one-on-one -on -one, by revelation. Now, we don't believe today in extra-canonical writings or inspiration or the Holy Spirit speaking to you or I. We're not charismatic. We're also not Mormon. We don't believe that God can speak directly to you on par with what he has in Scripture. Now, he speaks to all of us, of course. And he teaches us scripture. And as we give out scripture, we're giving out truth. But what you add of your own is your own and my own. But God was giving to Paul direct revelation. And Paul got the gospel from the Lord Jesus Christ, not from the other fellows. So when Paul writes his writings and the other fellows write their writings, for instance, from... Uh, James, 1st, 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and Jude, those six books, when they speak about the gospel, and they knew the gospel, because Jesus, obviously, they saw him right in front of their eyes, die and resurrect, etc. They knew what he told them to preach. But when they write their, their material, they mention the word gospel, I believe, five times. Paul mentions it 76 times. Paul got a hold of something, and it changed his life all the way around. Look with me. Um, I asked you to turn to Acts 26, but we didn't, we didn't look at the verses, did we? So let's go back to Acts 26. Sorry about that. Acts 26, Jesus alludes to what Paul says in uh, Galatians chapter 1. We're in Acts 26, and look at verse 16. Again, he's giving his testimony to Agrippa, but he says, verse 15, And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and look at this, and of the things in the which I will appear unto thee. So Jesus told Paul at the very start, when he first got saved, I'm giving you stuff, some stuff now, but I'm going to come back. We're going to have fellowship. I'll be around. We'll coffee collection, whatever. But I'm going to be teaching you some things. And I'm teaching you because you're new, fertile ground. And I'm thinking outside the box. And I'm giving you another worldview. You notice on that second line, Everything in the first line is in there. Well, everything is in there. 
You've got the 69 weeks, the Messiah is cut off. You've got Pentecost, the Holy Spirit coming down. What you don't have in here is, of course, the rapture here, but you have the trib, the millennial kingdom, but you have this as an addition, the church age. And the Paul, or rather Jesus Christ, revealed to Paul seven mysteries. I want you to turn with me quickly, in very quick fashion. We're going to look at the book of Romans, chapter 11, 1 Thessalonians, chapter 4. Romans 11, First Thessalonians chapter 4. Now, the title or the, the object of this lesson had to do with Paul's seven mysteries. And we're barely getting to them at the end of this lesson today. But I wanted to set a foundation for why I believe Paul was called and why it was Paul that was called to be the apostle to the Gentiles and not any of the others. They all could have been. But again, they had a particular worldview. And God's giving Paul a new worldview. So Paul is given seven mysteries. And as we look at these mysteries very briefly, in succession, as chronologically, chronologically as we see them develop in the Bible. So the first book we have recorded from Paul is in Romans. That's Romans. Right after Acts, first book is, Paul, is Romans. That's Paul's first book. as Not the first he wrote, but the first in line. And God places things in particular reason. So we're in chapter 11, the first mystery that God reveals through Paul to us, if we read through our Bibles chronologically, of course, is in verse 25, 11, 25. And I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits. That blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So the first mystery that Paul reveals to us as we read through is the, is the reason why we have a church. It's the reason why the church is here as such. Because Israel rejected the Lord, God opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And therefore, God developed and birthed the church. That's the first mystery that is revealed. By the way, the word mystery is revealed 27 times in the Bible. None in the Old Testament. In the, in the writings of the other apostles, James to Jude, it's mentioned zero times. In Paul's writings, it's mentioned 20 times. By the way, the word church uh, is mentioned by, again, the same apostles, James through Jude. I believe it's five times or four. Church, no, gospel, church is mentioned five times in those epistles. Paul mentions it 47 times, the church. Paul emphasized the church. He emphasized the gospel, and he emphasized these mysteries that God revealed to him, and the others didn't. So that's the first reason. The first mystery, how we got here. We got here because, not because God said, oh, you guys are better than the Jews. We got here simply because the Jews rejected their Messiah as a nation. And God went out and called out of the world, in part us. The next one, look at 1 Thessalonians. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm sorry, I'm going to the wrong one. I'm thinking in my mind, why am I going there? 1 Corinthians 15, my mistake. My mind goes to 1 Thessalonians 4 because of the rapture, but Paul doesn't call it a mystery in 1 Thessalonians 4, but he does in 1 Corinthians 15. In 1 Corinthians 15, 51, my mistake for getting you to go back and forth in your Bibles, but there's nothing wrong with that, is there? All right, we're in verse 51 of chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. So the next book, chronologically coming through, Paul shows us the end of the church age. Behold, I show you a mystery. 
We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the last